and welcome back to One History Help with me, Mrs. O'Neill. As you can see today, we are going through 1950s America, and I'm really, really excited about this. This is by far my most favourite decade from American history. Now, I specialised in American history when I was at university, and it was the 50s and the 60s as well that I really focused in on during my final year. Uh, and in particular, if any of you are aware of what a dissertation is, it's like the massive essay that you write about at the end of your time at university. I wrote mine all about 1950s America. So I am really, really excited that we're going to get to talk about this today. Hopefully you've got everything with you that you need to successfully take part in this revision video. Video. perhaps you're going to be making notes, perhaps you are literally just going to be listening and taking in all of the knowledge that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Here's a quick overview then of what we're going to be having a look at today. So just while you're having a look through that, I thought I'd just explain a little bit more about what it is about the 50s that I, I enjoy so much. And I think there are a couple of reasons. One is obviously the nostalgia of what I learned about at university. But even when I was studying these decades, the 50s and the 60s, when I was at uni and something that I've really, you know, firmed up in my own knowledge when I teach this to others, is that this is a really significant decade for many reasons. First of all, it's the decade where the America that we recognise today is very much being created. Uh, this is the time when a lot of American culture uh, really starts to take off in a way that uh, impacts on other areas of the world as well. So there, there's one part to it. Uh, another reason is because it's when we start to see the slow workings of the things like the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement that have been kind of slowly kind of ticking over in the previous decades that we've been learning about. They start to take off. They start to really build that momentum that will be seen even further into the 1960s as well. Uh, it's a time when Again, internationally, we've got lots of linking going on around the world, especially with the Cold War, which I'll talk about in the first point regarding the Red Scare. And from an education point of view, like actually teaching this topic, what I really like about it is that the 1950s are very, very similar to the 1920s. So if you feel you've got a good understanding of the 1920s, then you're going to understand a lot of the reasons why America becomes such a big, powerful, prosperous country during the 1950s and vice versa. If you feel you have a strong understanding of the 50s, it will help you with understanding the 20s as well. Let's get started. Going to start off with the Red Scare. Now, you will remember that the Red Scare isn't a new phrase for us. It's a phrase that we heard in the 1920s to do with this fear of communism. And what we're going to be doing when we look at the Red Scare of the 1950s is we're going to be putting it into the context of World War Two being over. America and the USSR were allies during the Second World War, but that very quickly crumbles away uh, once World War Two is over and we have the beginnings of the Cold War. So this this is something that we're going to see developing into the 1950s, but it does have a lot of similarities with the 1920s as well. Back in the 1920s, the fear that was surrounding the Red Scare was this idea that migrants who were coming to America from Eastern Europe and from Russia were bringing communism with them and that communism was somehow going to infiltrate America from that way. In the 1950s, the Red Scare is still a fear of communism, but this time it is a fear that communism is going to take over the world and that America could well be swallowed up with that in mind. Now, if you are struggling with understanding why Americans didn't like communism, then there are loads of videos out there that you can watch which explains what communism is, which should hopefully help you in a little bit more detail. Feel free to contact me um, via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or even leaving a message on here if you like, and I can point you in the right direction of a video if you want. And it will help you understand that in a bit more detail. But essentially, uh, the American way of life is the complete opposite to that of communism. So if communism came to America, it would essentially end the idea of being able to, you know, get rich from all the hard work that you do and being able to have the right to freedom of religion, freedom of expression and everything like that. 
Now, this fear, this idea that communism was taking over the world was actually a founded one. It was hard to believe back in the 1920s that every, anyone that came from Russia to America was a communist. Most of them were coming over to America to escape communism. But actually, this idea of communism taking over the world in the 1950s wasn't such a ridiculous one. Following on from World War Two, Stalin invades and takes over. Actually, no, I'm going to re retract that. Stalin doesn't invade. He's actually a lot cleverer than that. Um, Hitler was the one who was back, back before World War Two was invading countries in Eastern Europe, like Poland and Hungary and the uh, what was then known as uh, Czechoslovakia. But what Stalin does is he gets people thinking about communism and is able to establish communist governments in those countries and he really targets the countries that were previously occupied by the nazis because he knows they're going to be weak and vulnerable after years of effectively being abused by the nazis and that's exactly what happens so from the end of world war ii in 1945 up until the late 1940s so very quickly stalin is growing the soviet union the ussr into those weak and vulnerable countries so he's spreading out in that direction and then in the 1950s specifically China becomes a communist country and it is this fear that actually no uh, Stalin isn't just interested in going into Europe he is also interested in going down into China as well and the fear is actually communism is becoming very very popular so the American government and lots of the creative industries in America put out loads of anti-communist propaganda the slide that was on just beforehand when I was introducing the Red Scare uh, gives you some examples of that. Uh, but by all means, do if you want to do a Google image search of anti-communist propaganda from America in the 1950s, there are tons out there. Let's start to think specifically about what the Red Scare looked like in America in the 50s. So previously, like I said, in the 20s, people were suspicious of anybody who had migrated to America from Eastern Europe. In the 1950s, people began being suspicious of pretty much anybody in America. Even if you were as American as apple pie, you could still be suspected of being a communist. And it came this like almost really paranoid time in the 1950s where people kind of went over the top demonstrating their loyalty to America, like having a flag outside your house, you know, really being representative there on the 4th of July and everything. And the fear was that if you for a second seemed to be going against the grain, you were trying to be a little bit different, people would accuse you of being a communist. As I've said here, if you seem to be disagreeing with American values, then people would think, well, you must be a communist, a commie, as they would have called them during the 1950s as well. The fear and paranoia that communism was spreading across America led the US government to set up a group known as the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, I always knew it as HUAC. Um, they set up this group to investigate possible communists. So whether or not there was actually they were actual communists. And they investigated people in the government to see if they were um, having communist tendencies, communist ideas, and uh, they even had a look at movie stars as well. A famous group that you may well have learned, that, learned about, excuse me, was a group known as the Hollywood Ten, uh, a group of ten um, actors and directors and film producers who uh, were all essentially um, put on trial by HUAC for being communist and lost their jobs because of it. Someone who really typifies the paranoia of commun uh, related to communism in the Red Scare in the 1950s is a guy called Senator Joe McCarthy. And he is summed up with this, uh, this idea of something known as McCarthyism, which existed in, the, in America in the early 1950s. He was very much part of um, leading the way of finding communists in America. And he was responsible for putting suspected communists on trial. And as the statistic tells you here, there was over one million files held on suspected communists. People had their phones tapped. They were followed around the place to see if they were communists or anything like that. It was really, really shady politics and shady goings on. And one time, essentially, that leads to Joe McCarthy having a massive downfall is that he started to 
accuse members of the military of being communist. Now, I'm pretty confident I might have mentioned this in the 1940s video when we were talking about World War II. But in case you are unaware, veterans in America are seen as heroes. They are held in such high regard. So as soon as Joe McCarthy starts to point the finger towards them, people are like, OK, you have gone too far now. You know, OK, you can shut down that library because it contains communist books in it. Um, you can get rid of that movie star because they seem to have communist ideology tendencies, but you can't go anywhere near the military. And essentially he was put on trial and all of his dodgy undergoings were exposed. The idea that he was even fabricating evidence on some people to try and get rid of them and so on and so forth. And effectively he loses his job and he dies actually not too long afterwards. He was also a huge alcoholic so there was lots of um, problems with his lifestyle as well that were leading to him to be quite unhealthy. But McCarthyism really sums up this idea of the paranoia surrounding the Red Scare in the 1950s. Um, oh yeah there we go just talking about that there. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned in here but I will mention is that if you were um, suspected of being a communist back in the 1920s, what would happen is you'd be marched down to the, uh, the ferry port, put on a boat and sent back to where you came from. But in the 1950s, that wasn't really necessary because it was, like I said, it was everyday Americans that were being accused of being communist. And if you were suspected of being a communist, then you would be blacklisted. And essentially that means you would lose your job and on your permanent records, it would have that you lost your job because they suspected you to be a communist. And if that happened to you, then good luck with getting another job. And it's one of those things that uh, I remember a student asking me this year when McCarthy, you know, kind of disappears as such and isn't such an influence anymore. Do people get taken off the blacklist? And I thought that was a great question. And essentially, no, you don't. Even if, for instance, the blacklist is destroyed, that suspicion surrounding you stays with you and you would find that really really difficult because even though the red scare is a big thing in the 20s and the 50s doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the 30s 40s 60s 70s 80s 90s in america this fear of communism is a really really big thing for instance when barack obama was president of america and he wanted to introduce a national health service style healthcare system to america he was labelled as being a communist. And again, this fear, this idea that communism is going to be the ruin of America and anything that even looks like communism is going to be the ruin of America still hangs around to this very day. Next, we're going to have a look at the idea of the experience of rich white Americans during the 50s. I absolutely love this picture. Apologies, it's a bit distorted, um, but I absolutely love it because of it is just chock full of American dream stuff like you want to be able to own this you want to be rich and wealthy and have your own set of golf clubs your own speedboat uh, and so uh, your own little ride on lawnmower down the front there then work hard and all of this can be yours um, imagine the complete opposite to this picture and essentially you've got communism Americans have had a really tough time economically through the 30s with the Great Depression and the New Deal, the 40s with the Second World War, but their 50s are going to be another big boom time for the Americans, just like they were in the 1920s. So following World War II, the population of America increases by 40 million people. Uh, this is not just the case in America, it also happens in Britain and elsewhere in the world as well. These are known as the baby boom generation. OK, boomer, that kind of thing. Uh, and this was important because it means with so many more people around in the country, in America, it means there's going to be an increased demand for goods. Uh, more mouths to feed as well. So good news for farmers. And this is a general pattern that followed, like I said, internationally following on from World War Two. Uh, for instance, uh, both of my parents are boomers. They are examples of children from the baby boom generation. And that 
attitude that existed previously in the 1930s and especially in the 1940s, this idea of saving your money changed completely. Things were a lot more secure and stable in 1950s America. So people, again, back like they did in the 1920s, changed their attitudes from saving money to spending it. And my good Lord, did they spend that money. They bought so many products. Loads and loads of consumer goods were being made. And that mass production technique that we saw being introduced back in the 1920s was being used all over again to make products that were available previously, Hoover's, free fridges, radios. But now in the 1950s, the must have product was a television. 1950s is the decade where we get television for the first time. We don't have TV in the 40s and 30s and 20s. If you wanted to see a moving image, you'd need to go to the cinema. Apart from that, every home would have had a radio. If you imagine your uh, lounge and your front room at home and where your TV is back in the 20s, 30s and 40s, that's where your radio would have been. But in the 50s, we get this introduction of television. And by the end of the decade, pretty much every household in the States owns a television. Cars are a really big deal back in the 1950s as well. Back in the 1920s, it was a big time for cars then as well. But there wasn't much in the way of variety of cars. You know, most people owned a Model T Ford in the shade of black. But in the 1950s, you start to get people really expressing their personality through their cars. You can get cars in lots of different colours and you can also get lots of different styles of cars now. So this is around the time, for instance, when you get Ford Mustangs, you get Cadillac Thunderbirds as well. Oh, they're just absolutely incredible. Uh, last summer, I went on holiday to Cuba. Absolutely incredible experience. And in Havana, the capital city, they are still driving around in those classic cars from the 1950s and they look absolutely stunning. So cars and televisions as well are being mass produced again and they are being made really, really affordable. We've got wages going up this idea of affluence going back into America. America, remember, with lend lease during World War II, before they got involved, they were lending uh, weapons and food and medicines and everything to the countries fighting in World War II before they get involved. The deal was, we'll give you this stuff, but you can pay us back later. And now people are paying them back. Okay? These other countries like Britain, like France, are paying America back for what they borrowed from them during Lend-Lease. Exactly the same happened after World War I, when countries were paying back war loans to America. So lots of money going into America means wages are going up. I've said here not for everybody, and we'll understand that in a bit more detail when we look at uh, black Americans in the 50s and also women as well. For those big products like TVs and cars, higher purchase, buy now, pay later, is being used again as well. And I'm hoping I'm going to go on to talk about this next. Um, no, I'm not. I'm going to wait till the end just to check it's not in the next point, And then I'll bring up this idea of upgrade culture as well. The massive increase in the population following World War Two means that there's a desire to live in new areas. People are a lot more focused now on raising a family. Previously in the 30s and 40s, that isn't really happening. That's not to say nobody's having a baby, but in times when financially things are tough, people tend to shy away from growing their families. And also in times of war, in times of when there's a lack of stability, people aren't that keen on their, spending their time trying to increase their families. But now in the 50s, that is very much a secure and stable time. Families are growing, like we've said, those 40 million people that are being born. We start to see areas that are being created specifically for these new families, and they are known as the suburbs. And just to mention, this also happens in Britain as well. So the suburbs are, if we actually take the word itself, it is sub herb, sub herb. Herb is abbreviation for urban, so sub urban areas. And they are basically areas that are in between being in the town and the countryside. I would wager the vast majority of you who are watching this video now live in a suburb vast majority of you. Uh, I know where I teach at the moment, we very much live in a suburb. Uh, we would be seen as almost like a suburb of London and Reading and those kind of areas as well. And this was very much targeted at the rich and wealthy communities. Uh, but at the same time, houses in the suburbs were cheap. 
So lots more people were able to own their own home. And what with wages going up, being a homeowner was a genuine reality for a lot of people. When previously, again, back in the 30s and 40s, and even I would say actually back in the 20s, that wasn't so straightforward. If you wanted to be a homeowner, for instance, in a town or city during the 20s, let's say, you needed to have quite a bit of money, much like you would do nowadays. And out in the uh, rural areas back in the 20s, generally speaking, you probably lived in a house that was passed down through the generations of your family. Um, in the real rural communities, those rural farming communities, you probably even built your own house. So moving into the 50s, this suburb was like a fresh start for so many people. Lots of people wanted to raise their families outside of the towns, but still wanted to live close enough that they could commute into work because that's where the best jobs were, were in the towns and the cities. Nice little statistic for you here. By 1960, 20% of the American population lived in the suburbs. And that just goes up and up and up as the decades go on. Uh, yes, I haven't talked about upgrade culture. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, women and the family were common images used to sell products in advertising. I don't want to go into this in massive detail because we are going to talk about women as a group in themselves a little bit later on. But again, we're looking at target markets here. Who are the people who are spending their money. And this idea of living in a house in the suburbs, the whole white picket fence situation with your family, your, your adoring wife and your probably two children, I would say, um, kind of devoting to you. That was the ideal and that was used loads in advertising to sell products. That was the American dream. That was the ideal. The family life was the ideal in the 1950s. Very quickly before we move on, upgrade culture. Just want to go back to point number two and number three, this idea of people buying products. This in the 1950s is the first time we get this idea that when you buy a product, it doesn't have to last you your entire life. Let's take a TV, for example. You could buy a TV in the early 1950s, let's say 1952, and then a couple of years later, a new, better TV would come out on the market and you'd be encouraged to upgrade and buy one of those instead. That didn't happen previously. If you bought a radio back in 1925, that was your radio for the rest of your life. There was no desire to try and make better radios or anything because people were just buying them as they were anyway. But in the 50s, it's all about the upgrade. Got to have the most recent, the latest product available. And that has very much shaped our buying habits today as well. Think about mobile phones, for instance. You know, that is com an industry completely built around the concept of upgrade culture. You know, I always think that whenever I go and um, start a new phone contract, it's probably a matter of weeks after I've got my new phone that I think, oh, actually, there are better phones out there now. It moves so rapidly. So that all starts back in the 1950s, this idea of the upgrade culture. My favourite bit now, and if any of you are taught by me, you'll know how much I love this. So we're now going to move on to look at teenagers in America in the 1950s. And this is specifically what I wrote about in my dissertation. I wrote about American teenagers in the 50s and I talked about the films that represented them as well. So that's where I get to have my little bit of indulgence when I teach uh, about American teens in the 50s. Let's learn a few bits about them. So. Uh, I just want to make it really, really clear that teenagers technically did exist before the 1950s, but they weren't really recognised as a group in society. So in the 1950s, teenagers become a group in society for the very, very first time. Previous to this, so if you think back to the 20s, 30s and 40s, expectations on young people were very, very different. The idea would be that when you became 12, 13 years old, you would become an adolescent, which is a word that we still use today as well. But you would be expected to grow up and be earning money pretty quickly. Uh, this idea of staying on into long term education, like going to universities and everything, wasn't really that widespread back in the 20s, 30s and 40s. Um, in the 1920s, there aren't really that many opportunities for further education unless you had a lot of money. In the 30s, obviously, with the Great Depression means that people's uh, 
finances change and people can't afford to go through higher education so much. And then obviously in the 40s, most of these young people who are old enough to go into higher education are being drafted into the first, sorry, the Second World War instead. So when the 50s come along, teenagers, this phrase, this concept of a teenager is used for the first time. And the reason is because their parents are having a situation where they have more money than they had before. And these are parents who would have been growing up themselves in the late 20s and early 1930s and are in a situation where they want to give their children more. And the way they do that is they give them money. And so for the first time, teenagers have money that they technically haven't earned. Uh, like pocket money, especially. And a statistic that really backs this up is that American teenagers would spend between 10 to $15 a week on money that was given to them by their parents. And they would spend it on all sorts of things. They would spend it on going out with friends to diners, drinking milkshakes and, and eating burgers. Um, they would spend it on, um, if you're an older teenager uh, and you had a car, you'd spend it on going to drive-in movies. Oh my gosh, it's one of my life dreams to be able to go to a drive-in movie someday. Uh, they would spend it on music, they spend it on records, they spend it on going to the cinema and they would spend it on you know, pretty much anything, much like we really do today. So teenagers become a group because of that disposable income that they have. Because of this, they become, just like we were talking about with rich white Americans, a teenage become targets for advertising and products were made and also created to appeal to teenagers. And I don't mean this in a patronising way or in a judgmental way whatsoever, because I was exactly the same when I was a teenager. And teenagers don't always spend their money particularly wisely and they are known for being quite impulsive with their spending decisions. So they really tied into this idea of, oh, you must have this product. You must buy this drink. If you drink Coca-Cola, you will be the coolest person ever. You will be the coolest kid in high school if you uh, listen to this particular record or so on and so forth. They really played on this idea of the mentality that teenagers have, which is I don't want to be seen as missing out. So this like little peer pressure element to it and kind of cashing in on this idea of teenagers being reckless spenders. Yep, the 1950s were steeped in stereotypes about teenagers, much like every generation is as well. If you think about um, the view of teenagers in the media and stuff today, it wasn't dissimilar to what was going around in the 50s as well. Uh, yep, talked about this before, about what they were spending their money on, cars, music, fashion as well. My gosh, I didn't even talk about fashion. So many teen icons, movie stars and musicians. Uh, we'll go on hopefully to talk about those kind of people specifically in a second. People wanted to be like them, wanted to dress like them. And that was a really, really big deal. Um, alcohol as well. Uh, you may well be aware that the uh, drinking age in America is 21. But nonetheless, teenagers were still seen to be buying alcohol at this time. Uh, diners, drive-in movies spoke about them as well. If you ever watch a film like Grease, for instance, uh, what's another good one? Oh my gosh, the first Back to the Future movie, absolutely love it, which is set um, in the 1950s as well. You will see so many of these things, diners, drive-in movies. So if you want to really get a sense of this Americana, what it was like back then, then they are really, really good movies to watch. The most popular genre of music for young people in the 50s was rock and roll music. If we think about young people in the 20s, it was all about jazz and rock and roll does have its roots in jazz music, uh, but it develops into a real genre of the young. And the most iconic rock and roll star of the 50s is, of course, Elvis Presley. And the music inspired dancing as well, much like how jazz music inspired Charleston dancing, rock and roll inspired a rock and roll type of dancing as well. And it was really, really popular. Again, there's a great scene in Greece. And again, if you're taught by me, uh, I would have shown this to you where they have this kind of dance competition in the um, auditorium of their high school at Rydell High. And it really shows you how far some of these guys went with their, their dancing techniques and everything. It was really disapproved of by the older people, much like how jazz and Charleston was, because it was seen 
as being overly sexualized and uh, a bit too close for comfort. You know, the uh, rock and roll style dancing meant you had to be very, very close to your partner. Uh, and uh, yeah, the older generations did not like this at all. During this time as well in the 1950s, lots of movies were made to appeal to teenagers as well. Again, with that money that they had to spend. There was a, a real stereotype that teenagers were a group in society to be scared of. And again, like I said before, the stereotypes that existed back then are so similar to the stereotypes that exist of teenagers today as well. And this idea that the older generations were to be scared of them because they were unpredictable, they were disrespectful and everything like that, were really fueled by movies like Rebel Without a Cause, which is exactly it. Somebody who was rebelling against the older generations for no particular reason, or at least it was no particular reason from the point of view of the older generations. The younger generations would have been like, well, we're rebelling about this and this and this. You treat me like a kid and so on and so forth. The iconic movie star from the 1950s is James Dean. And he um, was a real influence to teen culture in the 1950s, especially the way he dressed. Him and Elvis Presley had this really kind of similar dress sense and similar hairstyle and everything like that. But um, older generations really didn't like this idea of younger people emulating and trying to copy James Dean because uh, James Dean tragically dies in a car accident that he happens when he's racing with somebody else in a car. And that's a scene that also happens in Rebel Without Cause as well, this uh, idea of art imitating life. So uh, people really didn't like this idea of James Dean being imitated uh, by the younger generations as they feared that his reckless behaviour would be imitated by them as well. So yeah, teenagers in the 50s, really fascinating and lots and lots of similarities to teenagers here in the 21st century as well. We're going to move on now to have a look at segregation in America in the 1950s. And I just wanted to make it nice and clear that although we're addressing this for the first time in these videos in the 1950s, segregation had been around in America for quite some time before then. So the Jim Crow laws that essentially were the segregation laws were introduced in the 1870s. Now, by this point, slavery in America is um, is over. Um, Abraham Lincoln emancipates the slaves in 1863 during the American Civil War. But it's not to say that when they are set free, that racism is suddenly not a thing in America anymore. Quite the opposite. And, um, you know, some historians will say that the um, racism actually intensifies following the end of slavery. So these segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws, we've talked about this phrase before, Jim Crow being a kind of nasty nickname uh, for black people. Uh, were used to put black people in their place. It was the idea that the black communities in America were treated separate but equally. And the laws of segregation remain in place in America until the late 1960s. Like I said, this phrase separate but equal justified the use of segregation. Yes, OK, you might have to live in a separate part of town, but you're still seen as equals in the eyes of the law. That's what it said on paper. But as we well know, in reality, that was not the case at all. Everything was segregated. Water fountains, schools, restaurants, burial grounds, transportation, toilets, intermarriage between black and white people was forbidden as well. And the slide just beforehand uh, that demonstrated just a couple of signs there that were put, um, put out were everywhere. So you would make sure that there was no chance you would use the wrong water fountain. And also like the quality of the uh, facilities available to black people were much, much worse than they were for white people. Uh, like I said, intermarriage between black and white people was illegal under these laws, and it was also illegal to try and promote this idea that black people should be actually treated as equals. Uh, the promotion of equality law uh, said that if you were seen to be, for instance, even just like handing out leaflets relating to that, you could go to prison and you would be fined as well.
thinking back to a previous video, the first example we have of desegregation, which is the opposite of segregation, uh, was the armed forces being desegregated. And that happens in the late 1940s after World War II, thanks to General Eisenhower, who is very much in favour of the black and white units of the army fighting together. Now, General Eisenhower, I wanted to mention him here because he goes on to become president of America in the 1950s and his influence as the president will go on to affect some of the laws that are changed. So let's have a look at some specific examples. We're going to take a look at three specific events from the 1950s where we see the segregation laws being challenged and changed. The first one is seen by this photograph here with these two people sat outside the courthouse in Kansas, in sorry, in Topeka, in Kansas, I should say. And it was something that all started with this little girl right here. We are looking at the Brown versus Board of Education case in Kansas, sorry, in Topeka, Kansas. I don't know why I can't get those the right way around. <laughs> so here's the background to the case itself. Linda Brown, the little girl that we could see in the picture there, had a two mile dangerous journey to her black school. So remember, all black children had to go to school together and all white children were to go to school together. When there was a white school literally just around the corner from where she lived. So the journey that she had to take took her through um, lots of different neighbourhoods. She had to cross railway lines to be able to get there. Uh, and again, like it says here, there was a white school just around the corner from where she lived. So the idea was, well, why couldn't she go to that school? And it's only the segregation laws that were stopping that. So the Brown family went to the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured Peoples. Now, that's a group that we first heard of back in the 1920s. And they've kind of been under the radar a little bit following World War II. They see a massive increase in membership to from I think it's 50,000 to 450,000. And in the 1950s, they are in a position where they are strong enough to actually challenge the segregation laws. So essentially what they ask the Brown family to do was to register Linda at this school and he, they also encouraged other parents to do the same. The school wasn't having none of it so the NAACP took the Board of Education in Topeka to court. This was in 1952 and it takes two years for the case to uh, run its extent. Two years later, in 1954, the case is taken away from Topeka in Kansas right up to the Supreme Court. Okay? These are an incredibly important and influential group of judges. You may remember the Supreme Court. We talked about it back in the 1930s when we looked, about, um, looked at opposition to Roosevelt's New Deal. The Supreme Court, they're the ones who decide, essentially, is a law constitutional or not? Is it acceptable in the eyes of, how, of, the, of what America was founded on? So in 1954, the Supreme Court decides that schools should be desegregated, but they don't give a time limit for it. Let's just pick out some of the key nuances of that phrase there. Schools should be desegregated. Very much optional. You want to desegregate your school? Go for it. If you don't, don't worry about it. We're not going to chase you down. And they also don't give a time limit for it either. And when I uh, teach this, uh, the analogy that I use is uh, imagine that I said to you, you know what, you've worked really, really hard. Uh, I want to give you £10 to you know, reward you for all your hard work. Um, incidentally, there is no way on earth I would do that. But um, you would probably be expecting that money What the next time I saw you maybe in our next lesson, maybe a week later. But I haven't actually told you when I'm going to give it to you. And the Supreme Court are exactly the same. They don't say we should desegregate the schools and we should have this done by X, Y and Z. They just leave it in terms of let's just leave it up in the air there. You know, we should be desegregating the schools. Let's see what happens. But it takes two years for them to come to that conclusion. And it was decided as well that schools in Topeka in Kansas only would be organised 
by area and not by race. That is a massive step forward, especially for the Browns and the NAACP. That is a huge step forward. That is saying that the schools in Topeka aren't going to be segregated based on the colour of your skin. They'll be segregated based on where you live. So Linda Brown can now go to the white school that is just around the corner from where she lives. But like I said, this is only happening in one city, in one state. Uh, I also haven't stipulated this here, but it also only applied to elementary schools. It only applied to primary schools, high schools, senior schools, middle schools. They were still to be segregated. So big step forward but also some steps backwards as well. And another step backwards we can see there is that the KKK have an increase in their membership following on from the success of the Brown versus Board case. And that isn't an unusual thing to happen. Whenever we see black Americans starting to get ahead, we also start to notice that the popularity amongst white supremacist groups like the KKK also takes off as well. This is the first significant victory for the civil rights movement. Yes, OK, like I said, in terms of the scale, it's not like something that's affecting every single black person in America. But it's the first time a law has changed to do with segregation. So this is a significant step forward for the civil rights movement. And everything they achieved was all above board. It was all done legally. They went through the courts. They presented their case. They argued it. They provided the evidence. And although Though it took two years, it went in their favour. So that is the first step on the road to changing those segregation laws. Had they tried to do this 10 years earlier, it would never have happened. And the reason for that is because people's attitudes are starting to change. And most importantly, it's the attitudes of the people higher up in the lawmakers of society in America, they are the ones who are having their minds changed. And again, the likes of President Eisenhower are going to have a massive influence in this. Next, we're going to have a look at one of the most famous events of the civil rights movement in the 1950s, probably in the 20th century, and a very, very influential woman as well, Rosa Parks. We are, of course, looking at the Montgomery bus boycott, which happens, sorry, which begins, I should say, excuse me, in December 1955. Now, in December 1955, Rosa Parks is arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus to a white man. The bus was full. The only space available was in the whites only section. So she took the seat and was asked to give up her seat by a white man and she refused to do so. Now, I remember when I learned about this at school and all of the education I've had since then, I've always been led to believe that that was a completely spontaneous moment that Rosa Parks, you know, took that moment that could not have been predicted, you could argue, and really used it to stand up for her rights by staying sat down. But actually, I've later found out that that was completely planned. And she went to the NAACP in Montgomery and said, I want to take a stand. I want to do something to go against what is happening here, okay, to show how much segregation on transport is ridiculous. And the NAACP said, you could end up getting arrested. In fact, you will get end up getting arrested. And she was fine with that. And so that's when it went ahead. So they planned exactly when it was going to happen, not the spontaneous moment that I know I was definitely led to believe when I was younger. Also, I think just want to take this moment as well to say that Rosa Parks is not the first person to do this either. Um, I'm going to get this. Ugh, I desperately want to get this name, lady's name right. I think it's uh, her name is Cla Claudette Colvin, uh, who is much younger than Rosa Parks, also does a similar protest as well before Rosa Parks. And also, it's not the only place in the world that it happens. There's also evidence in the 1960s of similar boycotts taking place um, in our country as well, in Britain as well. So Rosa Parks, don't get me wrong, I think she is a very significant individual and is deserving of her reputation that has gone down over the years. But I think it's um, good history that we must be aware that she is not the only person to do this. So going back to the boycott itself. As a result, in response to Rosa Parks' arrest, the black people in Montgomery in Alabama, Alabama, which is and very much was pretty much the most racist area of America, 
they agree to boycott the buses until a change in the law is made. In case you're unfamiliar with what we mean by this term boycott, this is the idea that the black people in Montgomery won't use the buses until a change has been made. And that's a big deal because most of the black people in Montgomery got around the city by bus. Very few of them would have been able to afford a car, for instance. So it was very, very common for them to be using the buses. So that's going to have a massive impact. The boycott lasts a year, begins in December 1955 and ends in 56. And in that time, 17,000 people take part in the bus boycott. Martin Luther King is one of them. This is kind of the first time in our study we start to hear about Martin Luther King. And during the boycott, he is arrested. Um, I believe he's arrested for allegedly speeding in a carpool lane or something like that. But it was, of course, incorrect. But he is wrongly arrested and imprisoned. And also his house is bombed as well. In 1956, the Supreme Court Again, that group of people right at the top of American politics and American lawmaking judge that transport segregation is illegal across America. And the, one of the reasons that historians believe that they make a change to the law is because there is massive pressure from the bus companies in Alabama because they are losing money because people aren't taking the buses. So there's a massive economic impact. And they're like, come on, can we just change this law so we can get these people back on the buses? Because the boycott was so strong. Look at the number of people who took part. 17,000 people in one city not taking the bus. That is absolutely huge and is a real demonstration of people power and what can be achieved by working together. And this is something that goes on to affect a lot of the um, events for civil rights during the 1960s as well. Had, let's say, 17 people taken part in the Montgomery bus boycott, do you think there would have been a change in the law? Absolutely not. Although, don't get me wrong, it would be a lot of solidarity to those 17 people. It's nothing compared to the dent that 17,000 people would make. So it shows the people involved in the civil rights movement, the importance of having large numbers campaigning and boycotting and protesting at the same time. Also, we are looking at an example of passive resistance, peaceful protest, no violence. The violence that we see here in point three, um, for instance, Martin Luther King's house being bombed, that was not done by the people taking part in the bus boycott. That is done by the likes of the KKK. So another big success Compared to Brown versus Board, we've got a law change that impacts the entire country. And again, there's a lot of valuable lessons that are being learnt from the Montgomery bus boycott in regards to people power. That's not to say that the success of, the, of Brown versus Board was insignificant. The success that they had in 1954 gave them the confidence to go on to do bigger things and thinking, right, OK, we're starting to see a change in attitudes here. What else can we start to make a change towards? The next one and the last event that we're going to look at to do with black Americans in the 1950s is unlike what we've seen so far. Uh, this is an event that takes place as and becomes part of the equality that black Americans receive in the 50s um, because of specific circumstances that happened. They weren't necessarily planned. They weren't necessarily predicted. Um, the image you can see uh, here, I think, is one of the most powerful images from American history. And it's not because of the lady you can see in the foreground. Her name is Elizabeth Eckford, but it's the lady that is just over her shoulder who is screaming at her. Let's look now at the events at Little Rock High School in Arkansas. So in 1957, nine black students try to attend Little Rock High School in Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas, feel free if you want to Google a map of America, you can see this in a bit more detail. But Arkansas is very much, you no, know, it's literally close to being smack bang in the middle of America. It's next door to Kansas. So I know that looks like you'd pronounce it as Arkansas, but it's Arkansas. So nine black students try to attend Little Rock High School. Let's just remember Brown versus Board desegregated some schools in some areas, but there was no kind of blanket change to schools across the country and definitely different types of schools would have seen more segregation than others. So 
the governor of Arkansas at this time, a guy called Orville Faubus, orders the National Guard to prevent the Little Rock Nine, as they became known, from attending the school. Uh, so the National Guard are like a localised uh, military force. Uh, they are not dissimilar to the Territorial Army. There are riots and abuse towards the students and their families as well. Some of the families actually lose their jobs over their children trying to attend Little Rock High School, which was an all rock, an all rock, an all white high school. So Governor Orville Faubus tells the National Guard, stop these kids from getting into this school. That's when we see the that, that crowd amassing like there. If you have a chance to go back and have a look at that picture again, you'll notice that you'll see some members of the National Guard actually in that picture as well. Now, President Eisenhower, here's where we see him properly for the first time. Remember, this is the guy who was a general back in the American military during World War II, who is the one who influences the law to change about the army being desegregated. He is now in charge. He's got the top job. So President Eisenhower orders Orville Faubus to call off the National Guard to say, you cannot stop these children from attending school. Faubus refuses. Okay? He does not want to cooperate with Eisenhower. So Eisenhower retaliates by sending 1,100 paratroopers, which is a section of the National Army, to protect the students. 1,100 soldiers for nine students. Can you imagine that in your school? Just imagine it for a second, that for nine students, you would see over a thousand soldiers in your school to protect them, to make sure they can actually go to, go, go to school to achieve their studies. The paratroopers stay at Little Rock High School for a year. Um, the numbers don't stay as high as 100,000, it does come down, but nonetheless, there is a military presence at this school for a year. Eventually, only one of the Little Rock Nine is able to graduate. And like I said, their families, many of their parents lose their jobs over what is happening. Now, one of the big things that we need to be aware of here is we are starting to get into the late 1950s now. And by this point, television, as we've mentioned previously, that must have product of the 50s, is widely available across America and now across the world as well. Lots of people, for instance, in Britain now at the, in the late 1950s have a television set in their living rooms. Why is this important? Well, it means that news can now travel a lot faster than it has before. And suddenly across the world, people are seeing what is going on in America. And think about it. Imagine you were a resident of Arkansas maybe not even Little Rock, but you're the, the state of Arkansas. Think about what is that saying? This idea of what's happened at Little Rock High School. What message is that giving out about the people of Arkansas to people across the world? It's not a particularly favourable message whatsoever. So the fact that these events are televised is a really, really big deal and has a massive impact on laws changing. So back up to the top of the tree again here, guys, the Supreme Court orders that all schools must look at that word there must. It's so different to Brown versus Board, which said the laws should change, that schools should desegregate. Now they must desegregate. But this takes a long time. It takes decades, in fact, for all of the schools to be desegregated. Unfortunately, it's not something that would change overnight. And so... Little Rock, for instance, even isn't a desegregated school until the 1960s. But nonetheless, that is a big change in attitude there. OK, this idea that now schools must desegregate, whereas previously they should do it. Now they must. And not only is that just in Arkansas, just in Little Rock, it is across the country. But like I said, it does take time. The last section then of this video is going to look at women in 1950s America. And I'll just give you a second to take in some of these adverts that are here that are all from the 1950s. I'm going to try not to talk about them for too long because uh, it basically just makes me very, very angry. <laughs> and uh, again, if you've been taught by me before, you will know how passionate I am uh, about women's rights and uh, 
and everything. So like I said, these are all genuinely adverts from the 1950s that were put out there. We mentioned before how women and the home life was a very big focus of advertising during the 1950s. And here's some examples of that. Oh, dear. Yeah, I'm going to have to move on because otherwise I'm going to start to get cross. OK, let's move on. Now, let's just give a bit of context here. Back in the 1940s, a lot of women get the opportunity to go out to work for the first time during World War II. And remember, there was a lot of positive press for women, lots of propaganda showing what a great job women were doing. Uh, we've got that statistic of 60% uh, of factory owners, business owners said that women made the best workers. And this was a real boost to women. But as soon as the war was over, the bubble very much burst. And it was expected that women were to go back to where they came from, quote unquote, back into the home, back chained to the kitchen sink, making meals and so on and so forth. And that is something that very much carries on into the 1950s. The expectation that the woman's place was in the home and not in the workplace. And a lot of women in the 1950s, especially young women, uh, women who, uh, for instance, uh, let's have a think, women who would have been probably around about my age in their um, early to mid 30s, who would have had that opportunity during World War II to go and work. A lot of them were really frustrated to say, hang on a second, why am I not allowed to go and earn a living? Why is this expectation that I have to stay in the home? And while that is true, there was, however, a significant proportion of the female population that were satisfied with this housewife lifestyle. Here's an example of that. The average age of a woman getting married in the 1950s was the age of 20. 20 years old was the average age of marriage, which is incredibly young. It hadn't been that young since, gosh, I think it even goes back to before World War I in America. And definitely compared to today's standards, that is incredibly young indeed. Um, how old was I when I got married? I was... I was 32. I was 32 years old when I got married. So, yeah, 20 seems incredibly young. Now, as well as this idea of marriage being very, very popular for young women in the 1950s and starting a family, we also have some progress in the form of the contraceptive pill, which, as I've said here, gives women the choice about when to have a family. So if you were a younger woman who wanted to pursue a career rather than starting a family, then you were able to do that. Now, just want to make it nice and clear that I have absolutely no problem with women being housewives and mothers. That is absolutely fine. I think it's a very honourable thing for a woman to do. However, I feel very strongly that that should be a woman's choice and it's not something that they should be expected to do and forced into. It should be their choice. So we've got this kind of two conflicting groups here. On the one hand, we've got these women who are frustrated and are wanting to go out into the workplace to earn their own money. Yet on the other hand, we've got this massive push of family values in the 1950s, people getting married younger. And if we think back to when we learned about the teenagers and also about um, rich white Americans, we have that massive boost in population. The expectation and the norm really was get married and have kids in the 1950s for women. As well as that, though, we do see an increase of women going into higher education. By 1960, there are 1.3 million women who are going to university. And that's a general trend change as well. I spoke previously how about in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, there really wasn't that much priority for anybody going through to higher education unless you could really afford it. But now into the 1950s, we start to see attitudes changing. And this is the first generation where it was actually more commonplace to stay in education for longer than it would have been for you to leave school and go and get a job. So we see an increase in general of people going to university, but women in particular, like I said, we've got that increase to 1.3 million by 1960. We also see the number of women in employment increasing. And now you might be thinking, well, hang on a second. I thought you just said loads of people, women are having kids and getting married young. Yeah, that is true. But you can't expect everybody to be doing that. Again, as with every group we look at, we can't generalise. We can't say that every woman in America had exactly the same experience. So the number of women in 
employment increases. Uh, we've got a statistic at the end there. 50% of the workforce in America were women by the 1960s. And before we get too carried away, we are still looking at typically female jobs, secretarial work, cleaning, um, nursing, teaching as well, seen as very stereotypically female jobs at this time. And as well as that, we have still got unequal pay for women. It was still the expectation that women would be paid less than men for doing exactly the same jobs. As well as this, if you were a woman who did have a job, and then you got married or had children, or well, preferably both, because having children outside of marriage was incredibly frowned upon, then you would be expected to give up your job. That was the expectation. As soon as you got married or had a child, ideally both together at the same time in the views of American society in the 50s, you would have to give up your job. You could not keep your job and be married and have a family. You could not do that. So as well as being underpaid for your work, your job was by no means permanent which I just think is absolutely horrific. And I'm so, so glad that attitudes towards that have changed nowadays. One last thing I just wanna mention about women in employment is that if you were a woman who was trying to say, climb the ladder in the job that you were in, you wanted to become a boss, or you wanted to become like a supervisor, a lot of people would treat you really suspiciously. Like, why would you wanna do that? Why is your goal not to have a husband and get married, sorry, get married to have a husband and have loads of kids? If you were a woman and say, for instance, you tried to become a lawyer, for instance, or a kind of job that was seen to be typically male dominated, um, becoming a female doctor, lots of people would treat that as with real suspicion. And especially earlier on in the 1950s, it was a great opportunity to label you as a communist as well, because that wasn't the American way. Women were to get married, have a kid or several kids, really, and stay in the home. So, again, it's kind of steps forward and steps backwards for women here and although I said earlier on when this video started we start to see the beginnings of improvements in rights for people in the 50s women aren't there just yet when we start to look at the 1960s and 70s that's when we see the women's rights movement start to take off in a lot more with a lot sorry with a lot more energy they're very much inspired by the gains made by the civil rights movement and they think we want a slice of this as well now is the time we can start to make a change and this kind of unhappy attitude from what it was like to be a woman in the 1950s was a really really big part of that and there we have it i've got to say i enjoyed every single minute of that. I absolutely adore talking about 1950s America. I hope it didn't bore you too much with uh, my little tangents and anecdotes and things like that. But I also hope that this helped you massively in your revision work that you're doing on 1950s America. As always, as well, remember, I'm hoping that you were listening to this and thinking, yeah, do you know what? I know that because you do. This is stuff you've been taught already. Remember, you can subscribe to my channel and get little notifications when I upload new videos. You can also follow me on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm at One History Help. I've got to say, um, the majority of you at the moment are following me on Instagram. So I do quite a bit more on Instagram than I do on Twitter. But that's not to say you don't you can't follow me on there. And also, I've got a Facebook page for One History Help as well. If you just go to the search bar on Facebook and search One History Help, you will find me from there. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon, this morning, this evening, whenever you're talking or sorry, whenever you're watching this. And I will see you again very, very soon. Bye bye.